And here we are for part three. When we're motivated and able, we'll use the central route. Otherwise, the peripheral route will carry the day. If I want to sell toothpaste, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you that it reduces cavities, and I'm going to give you the evidence. We had a 14% reduction in our sample of people who use this toothpaste over the last year. But I'm going to have a guy in a dentist's lab coat saying this to sell it to you. So I've got the central argument. This is the data about the use of this toothpaste and the benefits of fluoride. But look at me. Although I'm an actor, I'm dressed like a dentist. And you go, oh, look it. If you're not paying attention, you just say, oh, that, that dentist says to use Crest, so I will go ahead and do that. That would be the peripheral route. So the two routes to persuasion then, we got the source message, and it can be relatively complex, like the patent. Consider the audience. If the audience is of high ability, high motivation, right, they're interested in listening to this, or they're intelligent to process the message, you better use central route arguments if you want to persuade them. But some of your audience is going to be a little different than that, right? They might be of low ability or low motivation. They might not care or they're not able to process a complex message. Then make sure that you have peripheral route available as well. That will lead to persuasion. Two routes to persuasion. The best persuasive messages will capture both routes to be most effective for the largest number of people in your audience. So central components versus peripheral cues in the ELM, argument quality. People will analyze the argument quality if they're motivated or able. right? But peripheral cues, the source attractiveness or their perceived expertise. Look, Patton's up there, and he's got this freaking uniform, and he's got a zillion medals who s that say, hey, I've been here, and I've done it. He's a four-star general. right? So we say, if Patton says it, it must be good. And that would be a peripheral approach, right? So the message appearance style becomes all important. So always look at the background to see what's going on, because that's part of the, part of the peripheral uh, cue. Now, central component requires more thinking. You're often presenting data or information. Right? The peripheral route requires little thought. So you capture both audiences as fused both, right? Now, here's the rub, though. When you persuade using the central route, this means that actual learning took place. And it generally leads to more uh, permanent persuasion, right? When you use the peripheral route, right, it doesn't go deep. It doesn't reflect new learning. So you may persuade in the short term, but the persuasion is not guaranteed to last. Peripheral attending audiences tend to be fickle. And they'll kind of go with the message of the moment, right? So they are relatively easy to manipulate in that regard. So factors affecting motivation and ability. And here's where we're going to get to our assignment. Uh, you probably thought we were never going to get there. Right? Motivation. Well, personal relevance. If it's relevant to me, and note this election. This election, here we are in 2020, and we've already had 70 million people vote early. This is unheard of. That's over half the number of people who voted in the 2016 election have already voted. Why personal relevance? They feel that this vote matters, and it matters to them personally. And they're going to go freaking stand in line for early voting, or, or they're going to you know, request mail-in ballots. All these things that take extra effort. Why? Because it's personally relevant. Now, our assignment is going to tip a bit on need for cognition, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. This is what Petty and Cassiopo and some of their graduate students looked at when they were trying to understand the effect of using the two routes in their persuasion experiments is to what extent does this idea that, that people differ in their desire to think or, or their love of thinking Right? And I'm going to bank on our class, right? You know, 1,100 honors, we're probably h pretty high in our need for cognition. We like to think, right? Accountability is another manipulation to the extent that someone believes they're going to be questioned uh, about their attitude or about what they've learned, then they will attend to it more deeply. They will attend to the central argument if they feel they will be held accountable for uh, whatever they say. Now, ability, right, 
If you're distracted, you may not pay attention to the message. And this is why a lot of television commercials, they bank on the idea that you're not going to be paying attention when the commercial comes on. So they do heavy duty peripheral elements to try and get in your head implicitly, not explicitly, because a lot of the peripheral cues can operate implicitly, right? So they're going to try and, and use music, imagery, et cetera, that you don't need to process centrally. Intelligence is a factor here. Some people just won't get the message because they're not s intelligent enough to compute it, to understand it, to learn it. Remember, we don't say this often, but, but it's as true as anything on the planet. Half the people in this world are below average in intelligence, by definition. So think about crafting persuasive messages and capturing as many audiences as you can, right? And that's the skill. Another way that we get people to attend to peripheral cues, right, or not attend to central cues is time pressure. When you put people under time pressure, then they don't have time to think, okay? So I want to take a look at a couple elements, and these are just kind of sample graphs, and, and these things have been coming out of the Petty Cassiopo lab. Uh, it's the group for attitudes and persuasion. It's now Dwayne Wegner, Russ Fazio, Rich Petty, since Cassiopo left, among others, right? And, and what we see is here's the attitude, uh, so unfavorable versus favorable, right? And they ha deliver persuasive message, and then they're assessing the nature of the attitude change, right? And what we see is if it's high personal relevance, right, and we present a weak argument, then we don't right get much attitude change here with a strong uh, 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 argument and high personal relevance we get good attitude change if it's low personal relevance then the argument strength matters less people are more likely to attend to the the s peripheral argument but not the central argument right? and then one way that's the manipulating argument strength here we use expert source versus uh, non-expert source. And we see under high personal relevance, the source matters relatively little. Under low personal relevance, source expertise matters a lot. So these are the people who are looking for the central argument. They really don't care who the hell is delivering it, right? So perfect example, peripheral processing, right? Peripheral processing, the argument matters little because they're processing peripherally. But the, the nature of the, the persuader matters a lot. And then we see the opposite effect under conditions of high personal relevance. Now, need for cognition, and this is where I want to go, and that's why this is the kind of the last slide before our homework. If people have high need for cognition, right, they decipher weak arguments and they're not very persuasible. But if you have high need for cognition, and you have good, strong arguments, then persuasion takes place. Notice for low need for cognition, argument quality doesn't have the same level of impact. So you can see that the low need cog people process peripherally, so argument strength doesn't really kind of affect their persuasibility. Whereas for people, and I'm banking most of us in Psych 1100 honors, have high need for cognition, then we attend to argument strength and it matters in our persuasibility. So, here comes our assignment, you guys. Please take the need for cognition scale. So, and it's on Carmen, so it's right there. Uh, take it, and then I want you guys to, and remember, you're doing this in pairs too, right? So you each take it, and then uh, do you believe it accurately assess your love or lack thereof of thinking? And you don't have to tell me what your need cog scores if you don't want to. You can if you want. You can share it with your partner if you want or not. That's up to you, right? And then do you believe it accurately assess your love? But then I want you to provide an example of why you think it was consistent with who you are or not, right? I'm, I'm high need cog. I'm, I'm at the top of the scale. And, and a lot of us are, you know, who are in the social psych program. That's just kind of the way we roll, right? And I love to think, right? And, and I do, I, I think all the time. I think about everything. And I do a lot of reading. And I do a lot of kind of theoretical or philosophical reading that doesn't have straightforward simple answers so it's not something that I can read and say I'm done reading that because I've come to this decision or I've been completely persuaded this is right I will read point counterpoint continuously 
just because I enjoy the process of thinking through it, right? So, now, two, answer this question, and both of you can, you know, work your answer together, right? What's the relationship between need for cognition and elaboration? So, why was it important for Petty and Cassiopo, among others, to develop need for cognition in terms of studying the elaboration likelihood model? So, three, okay, a little story here. One evening, I shared a couple of beers with two car salesmen. Yep. This is honest, true story. Expectedly, they spent some time talking shop, and everyone talks about their work, right? One of them was a former student of mine, and he had several psychology classes with me. He was an older student, right? He was a psych major and graduated with his degree in psychology. As the conversation took on a psychological frame, they described the difference between car buyers at the Honda dealership they used to work at, that's where they originally, and both of them changed employment within a couple weeks of each other. So they'd worked at the Honda place, right? And then they, they talked to, at the Honda dealership they used to work at and the customers they encountered at their new place of employment, a Dodge dealership. So <laughs> what do you think? All right, we're setting it up. We got two different dealerships, right? Here's where their discussion kind of went. And, and, and uh, again, what do you think? What kind of customer shopped for the Honda Civic? All right? What kind of customer shopped for the Dodge Charger? And let's make it the Hemi model because, because that's really cool. Right? What sales pro approach would be more appropriate for each? So do a little stereotyping here, right? This person's coming in for a Honda Civic. What are they probably interested in? And what kind of sales approach should I use? And then what about the people who came in to the Dodge dealership? What are they looking for, right? So, and you can talk about terms of sales techniques of using peripheral cues versus central arguments as part of it, right? So try to weave a story together there. Think through it. Four, I'm asking you to stereotype a bit further. What do you believe the need cog level is comparatively between the Honda and the Dodge customers? And obviously there's exceptions, but I mean overall, on average, I'm asking you to stereotype, admit it here. And if you don't want to stereotype, it's okay in this one instance because I said it's okay, right? So finally, I ask you to offer three selling points uh, each for the two customers, Honda and Dodge. So now I want you to flip this around and kind of, you know, construct based on your stereotypes and the discussion in the previous parts. What three points would you like to make to the Honda customer and what three points would you like to make to the Dodge Charger customer, potential customer, right? Imagine you're the salesperson and you're talking directly to the customer. So that's it. And, and what I'm hoping is that, that you can, f coming out of this, see the influence of need for cognition as, as just one idea, right? And, and treating it, albeit a, a bit stereotypically, because I don't want to be too complicated in looking at boundary conditions and moderators and all, all that good stuff. But uh, go ahead and work through this. And, and I hope you enjoy learning a little bit about yourself with that need cog measure. And also, I included a, an article, kind of summary article that was relatively short in case you want to read further for the people who are super high need cog, but remember, who have the time, because you might not have time to read the article and understand that it's not necessary to the assignment, but I included it in case you wanted to. Okay, so check it out, and you'll see it's Petty, Bernal, and, and some others, and uh, so Petty was, uh, I believe, the lead author, and one of our good friends, Pablo Bernal, who's a professor in Spain, and, and then comes out to Ohio State for about three months a year, and does so every year. Uh, Pablo and I go way back, all the way back to graduate school, and he's just a great guy, and scary smart, oh my God. Uh, Petty's just brilliant. Uh, so read that if you wish, but there's your assignment, and this gets us through, I think, mid-November. Uh, so I hope you guys uh, have a little fun with this assignment, and I hope you, you, it uh, serves you well in your understanding how people are trying to persuade you, but also if you're in a position of having to persuade others, that it gives you some tools in your toolkit to make you a more effective persuader. So call it good. I see uh, if you guys are anything like Annika, everyone is asleep right now, but uh, that's one of the results of these lectures, at least for cats, right, Annika? So you guys have a great day. Bye.